you want to, you can be turning toward the 11th chapter of the book of Romans. I'm grateful for your being here. I would want that you were crystal clear on the fact that God loves you. God cares about you and is encouraged, I feel like, with what you've chosen to do this morning, the way you've chosen to use your time. The book of Romans, the ninth chapter through the eleventh chapter, is severely underpreached, if ever preached. We started, I didn't tell you, I began in nine, finished it, worked all the way through ten, and we're actually to the next of the last lesson of the series of nine to eleven. And I, I don't know, we'll be a while before we complete the 11th chapter, but I think we've basically made the points that I want to make in 9 through 11. I want you to look as you work through. Now, salvation. can be conditional without being merited. Hmm. Think about that statement and see if it's one that you agree with. Salvation is never merited by you and me. Therefore, we have salvation or we don't. But based upon the simple fact of the way God has chosen to give His Son and chosen to set forth the means of being saved. Now, as you look in chapter 11, and I'm going to just, on 1 through 12, give you the outline that we've already studied. But what all goes back to 9, 10, and 11 goes back to the ninth chapter when he began in 32 and 33, but I'm going to read them backwards, 33 and then 32. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Sion a stumbling stone, a rock of offense. Huh. What happened here is the Jew stumbled over God's stumbling stone. Huh. And whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. He stumbled over God's stumbling stone, 32. Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. They thought they could be saved through the works of the law, but they knew They couldn't live flawlessly, so they made an assumption that it was salvation by works, but God knew they couldn't live it flawlessly. Therefore, they did what they could, but it didn't end up to be that which God wanted. God has always wanted a salvation by grace through faith. A salvation by favor through us believing in that favor. Now, as you look in chapter 11, the thread all the way through is chapter 9. And they're saying to Paul, well, if we aren't saved because of the Messianic blessings, none of us are saved. Does God dislike Jews? And Paul says, no, no, verse 1. I am a Jew who have received the Messianic blessing. I am a Jew. Just read through it. And he said, I'm I'm as Jew as any of you. More maybe. And I am saved through the Messianic blessings. Well, then he goes on from there 
in verse 2, and this is where it gets a bit confusing and why I elected to try to write to some degree. He says, the real Israel, the real Israel is the whole Israel. All of us. The real Israel is the whole Israel. Well, that's right. But then again, that needs a caveat to be understood. Why does that need a caveat to be understood? The promises were made to Abraham, right? That of his seed would all the nations of the earth be blessed. Genesis 12, 3. Okay. And we realize as we go through that that had reference to Isaac. But what of Ishmael? What of Ishmael? He was of Abraham's seed. You remember Hagar was his mother? Because Sarah was barren, she gave her handmaid, Hagar, to have children of Abraham. What of Ishmael? Huh. And I look at that and think, okay, if the real Israel is the whole Israel, then why are the Ishmaelites not a part of the promise of God? Now, the Ishmaelites are the Assyrians. Huh. And the Assyrians and the Jews did not get along. And I see, hmm, that won't work. But then, coming through the promise is Jacob. But even there, as a child of promise. Jacob had a twin brother, Esau, who was also the firstborn. What about the Edomites? That's what Esau's generation was, or his lineage was, the Edomites. Well, the real Israel is the whole Israel, but watch it, and we'll keep studying it, because inside that being the truth, the whole Israel, or the real Israel, was only the believers inside of Israel. It did never mean, and yet it sort of did mean, everyone that was an Israelite, but all of Israel would be saved. Look at Romans 9, 6. They are not all Israel who are of Israel. What does that mean? That means just what I'm trying to say. They're not all Israel that are of Israel means the fact that you are an Israelite is not synonymous with being okay. The fact that you're an Israelite, you must be a believing Israelite. As be a part of the promises of God. Well, let's keep going. And let's see what we can get from that in trying to understand. Now, well, that's where we got. They asked the question, well, did God cast away his people? You see verse 2? And God answers the question with, who are the people of God? The people of God were never just because you're an Israelite. You had to be a believer as an Israelite. So he proceeds on further and makes it clear. Look at verse 3. And there Elijah said, And I am left alone. I alone. Verse 4. He said, but what saith the answer of God unto him? I've reserved to myself a people, 7,000 men, that Elijah knew nothing about. Now that's 1 Kings 19. 
And you can go read, that's specifically verse 18, but read the text context around it to get it. Elijah said, I'm the only Israelite. And God said, no, you're not. I have 7,000. Well, there were millions of Jews. Oh, millions of Jews. So he's talking about the child of promise. Now, this does all tie together with a very pertinent lesson as we look at it. But when he talks about a child of promise, that's God looking at those that he promised. He made the promise to Abraham, and that came through Isaac. And then the promise to Jacob, who became Israel. Mm. Let's keep looking at it. And he says finally, verse 5, Even so, then at the present time also, there is a remnant of according to the election of grace. Hmm. A remnant? Well, he said there's 7,000 of only, I mean of millions of Jews. According to the election of grace. Well, we know what a remnant is. It's a little piece of cloth you've got after you made the dress. You've got the dress, and what's left over is the remnant. God says a remnant of my people according to the election of grace. Election means to pick or choose. Pick or choose. And there's a remnant that I have picked or chosen by favor. By favor. Salvation can be conditional without being merited. We are saved by grace through faith. Those are the conditions. But we never think that we merited it, we earned it, because eternal life with God is so much more valuable than what little conditions we fall under that we don't think they equate. But you know, that fits into every realm of your life. Store has a sale. And in that sale, if you bring this little dinky piece of paper, you get it for half price. What I think by bringing that paper, I earned that which I got at half price? No, I would think I met the condition to be given that, not that I earned that. I met the condition to get it. Well, that's the way salvation is. Salvation is intended that you and I meet the condition. But we don't think at the end of it we earned it. Even as we look here, did Abraham think he earned that promise? No. No. It was given unto him to believe he would be a part of the picked or chosen, God picked him. Well, I don't know that I think that's fair. I don't mean this in any tacky way, but God's not worried about you and me thinking he's fair. That's why he's God. God has chosen a way to give us an opportunity and we will accept His way for that opportunity or we will reject His way for that opportunity. That's faith. Faith is to accept His way. Disbelief is to reject His way. To accept an opportunity. Let's keep looking at what he's talking about. He says in verse 6, the real Israel will depend on grace, not works. And if by grace, then it is no more of works, verse 6. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. 
said, you've got to understand those words are mutually exclusive. If it's by grace, it's not of works. If it's by works, it's not of grace. You, you can't make them the same thing. They exclude each other. And he goes on to explain there. Down to verse 11. Have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. God brought in the Gentiles. That's what he's saying there. To provoke the Jew to jealousy because of his unbelief and his taking advantage of the grace that God had given him. That's what he wants us to see. Okay, verse 12. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world, the world, the nations, that was the Gentile. You were either a Jew or you were the world. And the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more the fullness. And the fullness was the incorporating of the Gentiles, all that would be incorporated of the Gentiles. For I speak to you Gentiles. Look at 13. Inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify or glorify my ministry. If by any means I may, watch it, if by any means I may, two things, provoke the jealousy of them which are my flesh. I'm hoping Jews are annoyed that I have accepted Gentiles, that Gentiles are accepted of God. Enough, end of verse 13, 14, and might save some of them, that they might be saved. For if the casting away of them them Jews, bad grammar, good Bible. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? Oh. For if the first fruit be holy, that's the patriarchs. I just... Go with me. I, I think I'm going to draw you this picture. If the first fruit of them, the patriarchs, be holy, the descendants or the lump is also holy, and if the root be holy, so are the branches. Saying all the same thing. The root, the descend, uh, the root in the first fruits are the patriarchs. Now, if you want to mark that down, mark it, and you don't put it in your Bible until you believe the two. The first fruits and the root are the patriarchs. The lump are the descendants. Hmm. And if some of the branches be broken off, well, let's see what we got here. And now we've got some of the branches broken off. And we're trying to work through and these. And we see what we have in the root. And the root are the patriarchs. Well, then I've got the branches. And I've got some of the branches broken off. That's the unbelieving Jews broken off because they didn't believe. So the promise was to all Israel, but all Israel didn't believe. And even though the promise was all Israel, only the believers would be saved. Oh, okay, maybe that's working so far. Let's keep reading and see that. 17, and if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree. Well, now, who would be the wild olive tree? That's the Gentiles. That's you and me. Oh, 
And if being a wild olive tree, we're grafted in among them, we are grafted in as branches, and with them partakest of the root. We partake of the patriarchs. That's what it was, verse 16. That's what it is, verse 17. And the fatness of the olive tree. We get everything that the root gives. And we are grafted in to the tree. Huh. The unbelieving Jews were broken off. That it would give an opportunity to understand. And if there's ever been, if there's ever been a passage that's crystal clear, once saved, always saved, will not get it. And I think some of that kind of thinking's permeated us. We, well, we don't believe it, but uh, we kind of think we don't have to really work very hard to be a good Christian. Why? Because they believe once saved, always saved. And I don't believe that, but I do believe I don't really have to apply myself to be a Christian. That's allowing that to filter into us. We've got to keep ourselves pure. Now listen to the election point. Ephesians 1.4 According as he hath chosen us in him. Where were we chose? In him. Hmm. There is the condition. We're chosen in Him. Well, that begs the question, how do you get into Him? Romans 6, 3 says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death. <gasps> oh, Okay. And here's the election point. But we don't think we merited that. We just think there's a condition that goes with it. And the condition makes us the picked of God. You see how God's setting forth election? He set forth a plan whereby man would be saved that runs all the way from Genesis to Revelation. And it's consistent all the way through. We are elect in Christ. Now they were elect as a nation, but they weren't elect all of them. And we are not elect all of us. We are elect in Christ. Oh, he goes on. 18. And that's such an interesting point. Both not. You see, it used to be that the Jew thought himself superior because he was God's chosen people. God grafted in the Gentiles when he broke off some of the Jews. And you know what first thing we thought was? We are better people now. We're better than the Jews. And you know what I learned from that? I learned that if when you get the thought that you belong to God, somehow that elevates your value to the point you're better than other folk that don't. And that is 100% false. And it needs to be an attitude that never comes into us. We're not boasting because we're saved. We're thrilled that we're saved, but it doesn't cause us to boast. And we want to share and help those that have not that salvation. And that's where he's going right there. Boast not against the branches. <laughs> look, at, uh, look at the ones that got cut off. Oh boy. But if thou boast, thou bearest not. He said, I want you to understand, you're not a part of the patriarchs. You bear not the root. The Jews bore the root. So there's no place, Gentile, for you to boast. But the root they bore. And this is making a passage make a lot of sense that maybe we hadn't figured out before. Look at Acts 13 and verse 46. 
A lot of sense. Look at it. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. But seeing you've put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Hmm. We judge ourselves unworthy of everlasting life. When we hear the word and do not do what God asks us to do, we judge ourselves unworthy of everlasting life. And God will turn to another people. You know what a humbling thing it's going to be? We, we take it for granted that we're supposed to evangelize the world. And that's a good thing to take for granted. But what a humbling thing it would be if God sent the Chinese to evangelize us because we allowed God to get so far away that he wasn't here at all, how quick would you and I respond to a Chinese fellow explaining us the gospel? Oh, come on, man. You don't know as much as I know. Look at you. I, I don't know. I, I've never forgotten. I saw a Chinese delegate that was in the U.S. as a, re a, a responsible person of his government coming over to talk with us. And some of our reporters addressed him as he was about to leave to go back. And they said, what is the main thing that fascinated you about what you've seen in American Americans? And he said, the funny slant of your eyes. <laughs> And I said, the funny slant of my eyes. Have you looked at yours? And I realized my bias. My bias said he couldn't see my eyes as funny. I could only see his eyes as funny. And I realized that if God has to evangelize us from a foreign country, we're not going to do really well. It's going to be hard on us. So what does that say to us? Hold the purity of the gospel with all your life because it's worth that not to let it get away from us. I go on. I'm in 19. That will say then the branches were broken off. And we've already said that's the unbelieving Jew. That I might be grafted in. That's the Gentile. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. Why were they broken off? They were Jews. Because of unbelief, they were broken off. And thou will only stand by faith. So don't get high-minded, but be respectful. They will only stand by faith. We will only stand by faith is what's being set forth. For if God spared not the natural branches, watch it, you know who that is? That's the Jews. Take heed lest he also spare not you. Huh. Behold therefore the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity. But toward thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness. Otherwise, thou also should be cut off. And they also, if they abide not in unbelief, he's talking of the Jews, if they don't stay in their unbelief, shall be grafted in. They can be brought back. For God is able to graft them in again. For if thou wert cut off of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, that's the Gentiles, how much more shall these, these Jews, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree by faith? Hmm. And I begin to see what he's setting forth. Let's take it one more step, and we'll close.
One more step. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, or 19 and 20. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them, them who? Them taught ones. Good Bible, not good grammar. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all things whatsoever I've commanded you. Look at that. God intended Matthew 28, 19, and 20 that we would be taught all things that he has commanded. Yes, God wants us to be baptized, but that's not the end, that's the start. He wants us to be taught all things. He wants us to go on under perfection. You know, I see that, and then I go back to the elect, and I realize the elect are by faith. Well, what is faith? Faith is hearing, trusting, and obeying. And God is saying that yes, you heard about how to become a Christian and you trusted enough to obey, but there's a bunch of other things you need to hear about that you might trust enough to obey them. And don't act like you've arrived. You haven't arrived at any place but initial salvation. Now move on to indicating faith. Hmm. And when I look at that, I see that God broke off the Jews for their unbelief. Well, were they born properly? Hmm. Yeah, they were born Jews. Did they grow? They didn't grow in faith. They grew physically, but they didn't grow in faith. They didn't have the faith to keep God from breaking them off. And that made them jealous of the fact that God saw a people that would trust, that would hear trust and obey and he grafted them in huh. I think that passage preaches volumes I think I see crystal clear God doesn't need me I need him and I see my baptism in the light of what my baptism was intended it was intended to say to me for this is the beginning I've got other things I want you to hear. I've got other things that I want you to learn to trust so that you will obey them. I will break off those who don't have faith. What do they call themselves? Jews. What do we call ourselves? Christians. But you know what? When it gets to me calling me, I can call me self-millionaire too. You check my bank account and you'll find I'm a liar. Me calling me doesn't prove anything except I can still talk. God says, I know those that are mine. 2 Timothy 2, 19. I know those that are mine. I know the men and women that are trying to learn of me and trying to, when they learn of me, let me sink into their lives, their hearts, and their conduct. I know those men and women, 2 Timothy 2, 19, and those are the believers of those that have named the name of Jesus. Ooh, well, I thought I'd done everything necessary when I was baptized into Christ. You did everything necessary to become a Christian. Once again, 28, 19, and 20.
Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. That goes right past baptism. The all things go way past baptism. You know, I think the biggest mistake that we can make is to compare ourselves with ourselves and say, well, I must be doing okay because I'm in the top half of this congregation or the top third of this congregation, so I feel good about me. We only feel good about us as we measure ourselves to our master. Top half may be, I'll be the best of those going to hell. I'm not going to measure me with others that are like me. I don't know where the line was drawn for the broken off and the line was drawn except it was drawn by faith. Well, how much faith is enough faith and how little faith is too little faith? I don't have that answer. So what do I think the answer is here? I think the answer is to hear all I can hear of him speaking. And after I've studied it and know he said it and what he meant with what he said, I'm going to trust it enough to put it into my life. And I think God doesn't expect that I'm going to hear everything or trust everything. But I think He expects me to be caught trying to hear everything and trying to trust that which I hear and therefore I'm going to obey that which I've heard and learn to trust. I think that is what God calls the remnant. Be. You mean there's a Chinaman's chance someplace that I could call myself a member of the Church of Christ and be lost? I believe the Bible teaches it, friend. I believe the Bible teaches it. I could call myself a member of the Church of Christ and I've done everything necessary to become a Christian and still be lost because I haven't sustained living by faith. I think that's what Romans 11 is trying to talk to us about. I think Paul's trying to communicate that. You know, he did already communicate in Romans 6, salvation through baptism. Well, why are you going on, Paul? I'm going on because it's essential. I'm going on because it's essential. I'm not only vindicating God, I'm vindicating me. I want them to understand that I am a Jew who has received the Messianic blessing because I knew to keep going after I had become a Christian. And I'm trying to communicate to those of Israel. So what was it? The promises were made to Israel, but that was the big group. And then a more select group received the promises the believing Jews. The promises are made to all the world. Genesis, Matthew, Matthew 28. But there's going to be a select group inside of that that will live by faith. If you're not a Christian, Romans 6, 3 through 6 will tell you how to become a Christian. But don't become a Christian thinking that then you're going to sit down and not grow because that's a mistake. They were broken off because they refused to get stronger, to get bigger, to act more upon the Word. Become a Christian thinking in terms of I want to be mature, full-grown as a child of God. The invitation has been offered. If you're subject to it, we'd love to be of help to you. As together we stand the same.